weekend. <laughs> after the weekend special drop, <laughs> the one we're gonna ask uh, you about. Uh, what does Dango mean? Dango. Mm. Dango. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, yeah. 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 he, he knows a bit of Afrikaans. Shut up. We see how you got that one right. And then this one is for the sake of the podcast. Yeah. yeah. What is roadkill? What's roadkill? <laughs> Sounds a lot like my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our special guest for this today. I almost said this evening, imagine. Yeah, it's dark in here. I don't blame you, bro. It's load sharing times. You know? uh, please welcome the leader of uh, the Democratic Alliance, Mr. John Henry Steinhazen. Henry, thank hey. you. Great to know that one. Now, thanks. Nobody knows my middle name, but thank you for sharing it with the world. Yeah, <laughs> man. And shout out to you. You know, so he's the first uh, politician to drink grandeur. Cheers. Shout really out to good. you, man. Great gin. Yeah. Snap. Well, pull them up and, and they don't drink and, and moosey? No, they drink, but uh, when the cameras go on, uh, they have to, you know, oh, be snap. on brand. Yeah, even though there's so many viral videos of them <laughs> drinking, or of the one drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, man. Have you ever been in a shack like this before? Yeah, I have been in a shack. Not as, uh, not as uh, fancy as this one, but I have been some in... Uh, the Eastern Cape, but, but you guys done a good job here with it. Very, very nice. We usually throw this stuff away in, uh, you know, in Cape Town. Yeah, I don't worry. You don't have to destroy this one. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to destroy this shack like the ones in Cape Town. <laughs> we don't destroy shacks in Cape Town. We build houses. So, yeah. Oh. Yeah, what were you doing at a shack? What were you doing at a shack? Well, we are visiting people and campaigning in mm. Kailicha and rural Eastern Cape um, townships, uh, Winnie Mandela Township and, and the East Rand. Uh, Soweto, been been all over. So yeah. You've got to go and speak to the people at their homes. Yeah, you know, politics isn't uh, politics is a contact sport. Mm. Some people think that politics is on Twitter. It's not. Yeah, politics happens on the ground with people, yeah. and you've got to be out there. By the way, for all the white people that just tuned in who have never <laughs> seen this podcast before, <laughs> my name is Mac G. Uh, my co-host is Saul Penduka. I'm Saul. I'm I'm faceless for for today, but I'm Saul. You'll see that episode. You'll see my beautiful face. <laughs> <laughs> so a few weeks ago uh, on my podcast, we were talking about politics, right? Mm. And I was like, uh, isn't it a chance? Isn't it time actually to give the DA a chance? Oh my goodness. Mm. Fucking yeah. hell, the backlash I mm. got. They called us a political um, delinquents, uh, uh, illiterates in uh, politics. Yeah. yeah, We don't understand politics. So I'm going to shut up and just tell jokes and, sp and talk about <laughs> roadkill and trash. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> crazy, right? And where I was coming from, I was like, you know, the country's going to shit. So what else can we do? Like, shouldn't we just try somebody else? Even if we don't trust them, but just try somebody else. Maybe they're the lesser of the two evils. Because well, the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again, yeah, expecting a different, different result. result. But also when we've been able to demonstrate that there's a different way. It's not like, you know, we're sitting out here with a book full of promises. Where we govern, we're governing well. And we're governing in a way that poor people benefit, that there are more jobs. 71% of people in the Western Cape earn their living through salaries because there's more job opportunities there. Um, best housing uh, access to basic services. And that's our message to South Africa is give us a chance. Give us a chance to be able to do what we're doing in the other place where we govern in your community. Mm. I'm sure people are sick and tired of coming out their house and there's, there's crap running down the street mm. and the rubbish is not being collected and there's just no decent sanitation. or like It doesn't have to be like that. We can make it better. Yeah. And where we govern, we're not perfect. I'm, yeah. I'm pleased. I know you guys, we're not perfect, yeah. and I'm not perfect, and we make mistakes. But I can tell you, if you look at places where the DA governs, whether it's in the Western Cape, whether it's Midval, whether it's now Upapas in Mgeni Municipality in KZN, things are happening there yeah. because we focus on getting things done. So what I noticed after that uh, comment, right, I realized that post-apartheid our people, and when I say people, black people, mm. uh, haven't healed and they're scared because the first thing that everybody was saying is that how could you say that because the DA is racist? Well, well, I don't think we're racist at all. And I think that if you look at the, the chief beneficiaries of good, clean, accountable government, it's poor black South Africans. Mm. It's, it's those people that rely on government services. Wealthy people, 
You don't like what's on TV, you can go and get DSTV. You're not happy with the police that don't ever come when you call them, you go and have ADT or Chubb. You don't like the hospital down the road, well, you go to a private hospital. Mm. You don't like the public transport, you buy a car. Poor South Africans have got no choice. They've got to use those services. Poor young people can only access healthcare at those facilities. Mm. They've got no choice. And where those are improved, the biggest beneficiaries are poor South Africans. And that's the point I keep making. If you want to help poor black South Africans particularly, good governance, transparent government, where the money's being spent on the people and not the politicians, you're going to be able to see that difference. The thing is, you guys were joined, like, I mean, when you were created, you were joined, it was the DP, the NNP, and that was the National Party. So a lot of people believe in your DA, there is still, well, DNA. DNA. Yeah. I forgot the N, you know. <laughs> I don't want to say the N word. <laughs> So in your DNA, some people still believe there is that racism that the National Party, you know, uh, was heralded. Yeah. That's the problem. Well, well, the good news for them is that the NNP left the DA and went and joined the ANC. So Martinez van Skalkweg joined oh, yes, the ANC. Right. So that DNA is in the ANC now. It's no longer in us. <laughs> oh, so it's <laughs> not in the DA at all. Real. Yes, that's, no, he yeah. was, that's why he was a cabinet minister. He was a deputy minister, Mekie. wasn't he? No, he was a minister of, a, of uh, environmental affairs and tourism. He's now the South African ambassador in Australia. And he got rewarded. Um, all, the, all those National Party MPs, Francois Bjorkman, uh, all of them got, got positions they in the government. They gave them positions. Yeah, yeah. They, they were there. Oh, Jeez, that's wild, eh? Oh. So the DNA is there, not with us. Mm. And maybe that's why the ANC is messing up so much. Mm. And wh how, how do you aim to get rid of the stigma that the DA is racist? Like, wh wh what's your plan? By making sure that people see that where we deliver, we deliver for all South Africans. And that, you know, we're not going to take people's social grants away if we get into government. In fact... Our provinces and places where we pay social grants, it's the most efficient, effective. There's more places, there's more shelter. It's done more efficiently. But making sure that people got access to the basic services that give them dignity, water, electricity, sanitation, um, opportunities for jobs, public transport, and also by making sure that people see the DA. Have a look at our top six. Our top six is the most diverse of any party in the country. If you look to the left or right of us, those top six are monochromatic. I mean... The EFF's top six, all black. ANC's top six, all black. Freedom Front's all white. Here in, in, in the DA, you've got a party which has got black, white, Indian and coloured in the top six of the party. That is the diversity we want to see. Look at our Deputy Chief Whip in Parliament and National Spokesperson, Sivibu Guarube, young black woman who's been given that opportunity. Look at our mayor in Johannesburg and Paul Palazze, brilliant um, young forward-thinking woman who's there, not because she's black and because she's a woman, but because she's excellent. Mm. And I think when people start to see the DA for who we are and not, under, not, not be tricked by the misconceptions that yeah. are out there, yeah. they're going to start seeing we're a party that's serious about diversity. We're serious about addressing the inequalities of the past and overcoming our terrible history because you're right, people still carry deep scars. Mm. But the reality is we're not going to fix those wounds and bind those wounds by layering more race-based policies and nationalism and tribalism and ethnics on sure. top of that. Mm. We've got to unbundle that and we've got to see people for who they are, mm. not as envoys of their race or their language or, or, their, or their ethnicity. We've got to see South Africans who they are and what their contribution that they where, can make. Where do you guys stand with, um, with affirmative action and BEE? Well, I don't think BEE has worked, and I think that uh, BEE is not broad-based and it's not empowering. And if it was, we wouldn't have a 42% unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have black households now 10% poorer than they were 10 years ago. You would have seen massive advancement. Instead, we've seen a very small group of people getting exceptionally yes, rich. Yes, very Exceptionally true. rich. Very true. And so what we believe in is having a empowerment policies that focus on poverty. There's 30 million people in South Africa that live in poverty. 99.7% of them are black, precisely for the reasons that you've spoken about, the legacy of apartheid and colonialism sure. and the like. If you focus your policies on poverty, you're going to assist, the majority of people you assist are going to be black South Africans yeah. without having to resort to crude racial quotas. Mm -hmm. It's the way NISFIS works. It's the way housing allocation works. It's the way SASA works. You qualify, you fall under the poverty threshold, you're the beneficiary. That way you cut out the fat cat elite because they are no longer in that category. They are now wealthy. They've earned their money. Why do we keep empowering that top layer 
and nobody underneath gets empowered. Mm. No one's fighting for those 30 million people. It's the ultimate insider outside a stitch up. You've got big business, big government, big labor sitting around a table planning on how to lock out the 30 million people, majority of them are young South Africans, out of opportunity. And that's wrong. We've got to, we've got to break that, that, that model and rebuild one that's going to create a more inclusive economy that's growing. When the economy grows, everyone benefits. But surely it can't be that easy because now you're taking money out of their pockets and they don't want that. Well, it's got to be that way. We've got to do it. We're not going to be able to rescue the 30 million people who are trapped in poverty mm. if we keep the consensus where the rich keep being empowered. It's, it's wrong. It doesn't work. And it doesn't work anywhere in the world. You've got, you know, trickle down doesn't work. You've got to focus your, your, um, your, your uh, policies and empowerment and assistance on the people who need it. You don't focus SASA grants on wealthy people. SASA grant is focused on people who live below a threshold. And it's meant to help them. And that's the way you've got to do it. You know, the, it, it's, like, it's like seeing somebody lying on the side of the street with a gunshot wound, you know, racial policies. Mm -hmm. You don't go and shoot the guy again and say, oh, well, maybe that'll fix you. You've got to do something different. You've got to heal, bind, you know, and, and, and fix those, the, those wounds and do something different. So when you interact with the elite, uh, let's say the Stellenbosch Mafia, for example, <laughs> and you say exactly that, what do they say? I don't think that they're, they're, they're the, uh, or they are part of, big business is part of the problem because they, you know, they're in this, this BE was actually a, a consensual stitch up between big business and, and the ANC. I think that there's a genuine effort and, and desire to move the needle, but we've got one thing standing in the way and that's greed. Yeah. Greed. Hence why I'm asking that. Yeah. You know, people must be willing to let go uh, of, you know, of that domination. And we've got to understand that if you've got money and means, you can take care of yourself. We've got to focus all of our energy on lifting those 30 million people out of poverty and into opportunity. As Ted Kennedy famously said, if you can't help the many who are poor, you cannot save the few who are rich. We've got to stop. We've got to stop empowering the top and focus on how we get that 30 million people upwardly mobile into some form of employment, into some form of forward trajectory. Because the longer those people stay excluded from the economy, I think the longer it's going to take our social uh, fabric to rebind and restitch together. And those people present a huge risk to South Africa if they remain excluded. Because we're already starting to see the fraying of that through xenophobic violence, yeah. through, through what we saw in July last year, mm. uh, <coughs> etc. And we've got to do something. Otherwise, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Do you have a relationship with the Stellenbosch Mafia? Well, we've got some donors who come from there, but um, you know, those people give most of those people give their money to the ANC and to for real, and to, yeah, and to, and to big business. I mean, yeah. a lot of those people funded Cyril's presidential campaign and gave him money because they thought they could buy. It in How does that work in politics? Is it mm. a, a thing of because in my head it's a I scratch your back, you scratch mine yeah. when you're in power. You give me a gin, I give you <laughs> <laughs> an interview. <laughs> Grand, grand your gin. Every, every home should have one. Hey, I like that. Hey, that's the promo. That's the intro right there. That's the intro. <laughs> um, look, I mean, how we work, we take, we receive the majority of our income through donors. Yeah. It's disclosed. It's on the IEC website. It's not a secret. Anyone can see who gives us money. Oh, okay. Um, and that's the, the law, and we comply with the law. Not every party is doing it, but... Mm. You know, I don't know how some of these parties afford these big billboards and that. And then they say, oh, no, we didn't get any donations this year. Mm, mm. You know, and uh, so it's, um, <laughs> yeah, so, so it's declared. Um, I don't accept quid pro quos. If someone says to me, I'll give you a donation if you do this, we say, sorry, it's not how it works. You, uh, you give us a donation and we will, you know, we will do our, our, our politics and provide an alternative in South Africa. But it's not going to be a, well, you know, I want my plans passed, so, so here. I'm sure that happens, and I'm sure it happens across the spectrum, uh, which is why they've tried to bring in this transparency now around the party political funding. But, um, you know, it's not something we practice in the DA. So in Cape Town, there's no one who's given you, or a company that's given you donations, or an individual, mm -hmm. and their company has benefited from a construction of some sort that had to be passed and approved by the company. No, and, 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 and if they had and they got business, it would have been done through a completely separate process because we have a very strong 
separation of powers within the DA. I don't have ah. any say over which contracts the city of Cape Town awards. Ah. We don't have a cater deployment committee that says, well, you know, I decide who goes there and, and who sits there and who's going to be deployed there. Our government processes are completely separate. What the mayor and his team in, in Cape Town do, yeah. uh, you know, you'll have to account to me at some stage, but I, we don't interfere in the day-to-day -day running of those municipalities. Uh, a lot of people, like when I'm in Cape Town, right, they, they almost say that the DA takes care of Cape Town that the world knows, but not the Cape Town of, you know, Langa, the township. Kailicha. And that's why, mm. yes, Kailicha. And if you look at the top murder city capitals in the world, I think last time I checked, Cape Town is number eight. What are you guys doing about that? Yeah. And Joburg is like all the way down, number 40. I think mm. Durban is number 30-something yeah. or 20-something. Oh, for something. real? Yeah, Cape Town, yo. Limpopo there's always like mass shootings. Something. Yeah, yeah, there's just... <laughs> Number one in they don't, they don't report. They don't, don't report the it in Limpopo. <laughs> they don't report it in Limpopo. <laughs> no one calls the police because they don't come anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like what's the DA doing so, about okay. the murders? There's yeah. so much killing in yeah. Cape Town. So man. anyway, let, let's just start from the from the from the from the beginning. There, policing and security, unfortunately, is a national competence, which makes it very difficult for us as a province and a city because it's located at national government, and you know the. The Pratt and the Hat is in charge of, uh, of police in the country. <laughs> the Hat. Uh, <laughs> and um, <laughs> so it, it's difficult. But we can't sit back and say, well, policing's not our responsibility. Of you know, course. Because it's our people that have voted for us there that are yeah. being murdered and, and the like. So what have we done? The province and the city have got a program called LEAP. And we've paid now for extra police personnel on the ground. And I'm glad you mentioned Langa because there's the best example. Langa was the murder capital of the Western Cape and okay. the last set of crime stats before um, the latest ones came out. And so the Premier and the city got together and we deployed a 1,000 police officers on the ground there. Langa's now dropped off the stats. What does it prove? Wow. What does it show? If you localize policing, it's more effective. Having a national police plan and trying to shoehorn it is like trying to put a square peg into a round hole. Rather let policing happen from the local level up because people understand the dynamics. Secondly, mm -hmm. drugs are a big driver of the violence there and the gangs there. Oh. And that requires national intervention. You require intelligence-driven operations to get to the bottom of it. And let's look at some of that. The police-to-population ratio, which is the measure that you use to, to determine the quality of policing, in some of the worst stations, like Googs and, and, and Langa, it's 550 um, citizens to one police officer. The average, the world average, should be around 149. Sure. Out of, so you can see, deeply under-resourced, which is, makes the case even more. And so we keep saying, let's take policing away from a national level. Let's make local uh, uh, municipalities and provinces to have policing. That's the worldwide best practice example um, that, that you can use. Then we can really fight crime. But as I say, it's like the trains. We're not in charge of the trains. Mm. Oh. But we understand we've got to move people safely mm. to work. Mm. And many people, you know, can only rely on, the, on trains to get to work. Yeah, so cool. we can't sit back and say, well, hey, Fakile, sort your trains out. It's not our problem. Yeah. Yeah. We've, got to, we've got to get in there. We've got to get in there and... and and oh, my cup runneth over. Thank you. Uh, we've got to <laughs> get right, in there and do you. something. So we're putting, we're putting officers now onto the trains. We're taking charge of platforms because we want people to use public transport. Um, so it's about intervening and making those things. But we could do so much more if power was actually devolved to local, uh, local level. But I've got to be honest with you. Speaking about Cape Town, right? Mm. You've got to tell your people to chill, man. The racism there is like it went to private school, man. Yeah, it's like... Mm. It's bad. Racism, it's like white yeah. people in Cape Town. White people in Cape Town, they feel the liberty. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's our country. <laughs> yeah, you motherfuckers in Dover can do whatever you want. If you're fucking here, yeah, bro, you're fucking listening the to only me time and me in the eye. I've been in Crazy. Cape Town and I never experienced racism from a white person mm. was because they were a foreigner. Like, mm. Someone who's visiting... A tourist. A tourist. Yes, yes. yes. You should see how they treat people from Durban. <laughs> I'm from Durban. Yeah, yeah. You're from Durban, yeah. Yeah, I know. Tell them to yeah. chill, man. Jeez, bro. It's bad. It's all... Bro, I've never experienced the, the racism I experienced. Literally, I was on the... What do they call it? The promenade. What is it? The prom... Sea point promenade. Yeah. And a guy literally came to me on his skateboard and expected me to move out. But he didn't know I'm from Joburg. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am just watching him like I dare you. I dare you. Skate into me, motherfucker. I dare you. 
And then a, a whole argument ensued. And he had to come and reprimand me like, yo, yeah, I'm bro, like, yo, we in Cape Town, bro. We in Cape Town. Chill, it's not Joe Fuck him, Tony. Well, you, I'll tell you <laughs> what. I don't know what's up with the grace. I'll give you my number so when you're there again and this happens, call me. I'll come and help you out. Look, I think that we've. I think we've still got this problem in South Africa. Let's mm. let's be honest and yeah, confront we do, it. Man. Mm. We've got people who still think that their race makes them superior for to sure. others, for sure, and that it entitles them to some form of special treatment. Mm. And we've got to break that down, mm. and we've got to confront it wherever we see it. Mm. We've got to make sure that 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 where we see people saying racist things, doing racist things, that we confront them. It's not good enough to turn a blind eye to that. I mean, mm. I've had people around my dining room table before. And somebody used an inappropriate word, and I said, please, you need to leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've yeah. got to call them out. There was yeah. a great book by Malcolm Gladwell about how they defeated the Ku Klux Klan uh, yeah. in, in America, in America. Um, by, you know, just facial expressions and, and, and calling people out. Oh, I and thought it's because they gave them badges. I'm reading Malcolm Gladwell, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to call that behavior out, and it's not, it must not be tolerated, and we must all speak out against it. But... You know, you don't need to be a black South African to speak out against racism against black South Africans. Yeah. And that's why oh, I think there's a yes. duty on all of us to where we see racism to confront it and to, and to deal with it. Are there some people who, who are generational? Who, yes. You know, mm. But it really, you know, it really hurts me when I see those flags that those guys were flying outside, those Nazi flags outside that school in, I think it was the Northwest province. Mm. And you see those parents standing there and you see those children standing there. What future are you giving those kids in South Africa mm. when they've got to grow up hating other South Africans based on nothing other than the color of their so skin? So what do you think of Urania? <laughs> People want to live like that. They must live like that. I, I, you know, I, why would you not want to live in a beautifully diverse community? I mean, I live, I'm lucky enough to live in a street where you know, all races, nations uh, stay, and I think we're richer for it. I, I don't, and this is this is a big thing, the big fight that I have with with some boaters, particularly up north, who think that you're safer in a little camp or yeah. lager. Yeah. What if you want to be safe? You bring people who look like you, mm. who sound like you, who talk the same language as you around you, mm. Mm. and that you have a little lager. I say to people, no, that your language rights, your culture rights, you are better protected in a broad party that represents everybody's interests equally, where you can fight for Afrikaans as hard as you fight for Isi Tos and Isi Zulu, mm, yeah. where we can defend each other's cultures and rights. They're far better defended in a big party rather than in a small little uh, enclosure or camp where gotcha. you can just simply be swept out of the way. Yeah. And that's the point I make to voters about, you know, why voting for these small little niche parties of 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 people who look and sound like you is wrong. Mm. It's not the future. If we, we want to... Stand up for what's right. We've got to build a broad front and bring people together from different communities at that center to be able to, to drive it forward. Let's talk about the municipal cities that you guys run. I don't know. They, they run Soweto. Did you know that, bro? Soweto. I know Midval. Yeah. No, Just after Alberton. Mm. Wow. You got the whole of Soweto. Well, the whole of Joburg. Well, it's run by well, a coalition. Well, Joburg, yeah, and Port Palazzi, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's run as a mayor. coalition. Yeah. So I want you to talk about wow. the cities that you guys run, mm. right? So... Just name them. Mm. Tell us what state you found them in and what you guys have done. Yeah. So, so up here in Gauteng, we yeah. do, uh, we've got uh, Chwane, Johannesburg, Ekuleni, which is where old Masina was. Yeah. And then we also run Makhali City for our sins. Okay. Uh, which is the old, um, I think it's called Krugersdorp. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Davelsdorp. Yeah. 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 Makhali yeah. City is yeah. Krugersdorp. Yeah. Krugersdorp yeah. 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 side. Yeah. 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 Um, so we found them in a terrible state. I mean, they've been neglected over years. Mm. And part of the reason why these municipalities are in such a terrible state is that the municipal government has not invested in the infrastructure. So the invisible services that you need to run a city, water, electricity, sanitation, which is why there's this crap running down the streets all the time. Yeah. And, and, and there's electricity outages and, you know, the, the street lights don't work. And, and why is that the case? Because every year they take that money that should be going into that and put it into stadiums that no mayor wants to go and open a sewage treatment works. Mm. Who wants to cut a ribbon on a sewage treatment works? They want to cut a ribbon on a stadium or, or a, a housing... You know, or a flag. You know, something <laughs> like that. So they want to cut the, they cut the ribbon on that. <clears throat> and so these services have been neglected for two decades. Yeah. And they're now failing in a big way. Yeah. So the cities are having to now reinvest in infrastructure. So that's what you guys are doing right yes, now? Yes, no, so okay. that's what we're doing now. So we large parts of our budget and Popolazzi's budget and the, the coalition government there... 
China the same, ecclesiastical, investing in infrastructure. It's going to take a few years. Yeah. It's, not, it's not going to be an overnight solution, and people need to understand that. You're overcoming years of neglect. But I have no doubt that once that infrastructure starts being rolled out, there's going to be less water outages, less electricity outages, and people are going to start to feel the difference. You know, Cape Town wasn't turned around overnight. It's mm. the best run metro in the country. It wasn't turned around overnight. It was... Um, it took a few years. Mm. Um, there's parts of Cape Town that people never used to even go to, places like Seapoint. Mm. Used to be boarded up. And, oh, for real? Yeah, bought, because people couldn't sell the property there. It was overrun by wow. drug lords and, mm. and prostitution and the like. And um, it, it, took some, it took some real effort to, to, get, it, to get it sorted out. And, but it can be done, and that's the point. Yeah. With I the right that. political will, with the right people in place, and spending the money on the people, not the politicians, you can get it done. I stay in Centurion, and, um, which is run by you guys. And uh, our electricity, whatever thingy where we get it from, is in the hood. And the nearest hood is Olivin. Mm. So now what happens is when there's load shedding, the guys in Olivin steal the cables. Mm. So when, there's, when the electricity comes back, we can have like 12 hours without electricity. Mm. It's terrible, dog. Yeah. I was with Mpopalati. And the mayor, and the mayor's nowhere to be seen. Yeah. No, well, I was with her the other night. Mm. We went out on the streets. We went on a raid to go out in Joburg to, to look at, at what's going on there. Yeah. Um, and that's the point we're making to Eskom is that, A, when you load shedding, when you're putting the lights back on, it's putting huge strain on the system because it blows the substations. But also you're creating an opportunity for cable thieves. Yes, yes, yes. Cable thieves can then go and pull the stuff down. And... That evening, we found almost two and a half kilometers worth of illegal connections mm. onto that. And <clears throat> it puts strain on the system. Why don't you just put securities there? Because you can't put security everywhere. And this is why we're partnering now with neighborhood watches, private security oh, companies, okay. in a whole of society approach to help combat it. So we went out on a joint raid with Metro Police, SAPS, the neighborhood watch, gotcha. um, you know, the community um, community organizations to go out there and try and do it. But we've got to end load shedding. I mean, load shedding is, is, is nonsense. I mean, mm. when you travel overseas... Yeah, we were in the UK people, the other day. Yeah, you tell people... Yeah, you t- <laughs> <laughs> yeah for the a thousandth time, we were in the UK the other day. <laughs> Um, you tell people overseas that you go 18 hours a day without electricity yeah. in stage four. They don't Can't believe fathom you. that. No, they yeah. don't Can't believe fathom you. It. They don't believe you. They think you, you're pulling their leg. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that wouldn't have happened under your watch, load shedding. Um, no. And, and this is why, you know, we said from the beginning, the model is broken. If you have one cell phone provider, that person can treat you however they want because mm. you've got nowhere else to go. Mm. Imagine if there's only Vodacom or mm. only MTN. Mm. They're not going to care about you or your mm. problems. Or yeah. They'll charge you what they like. And yeah, yeah. It's a you, monopoly. Because you've got no choice. Mm. And it's the same with Eskim. We don't have a choice. And so they treat us like they want. They don't, you know, the corruption and stealing that took place there. What's your solution? <clears throat> so our solution yeah. is what we're doing in Cape Town, bringing independent power producers onto the grid. Um, allowing them. We already are one's load shedding level below the rest of the country. So when Joburg's on load shedding level one, there's no load shedding in Cape Town. Wow. There's a hydroelectric power plant there which allows us to, to do that. And we are, the mayor there has announced we are going to be wow. the first city in South Africa to be load shedding free. Whoa. And there's six other municipalities in the Western Cape that are in a race to do that. And just today, Chwane is busy trying to pass um, some some stuff to be able to make Chwane load shedding free out. It's a bit difficult to get it through yeah, from the coalition partners. But yeah, I wanted to ask you that <coughs> when it's a coalition, right, mm. do the other party uh, uh, deliberately try... Sabotage. Sabotage you. Well, I, I wouldn't like to think that they do. But, you know, if I, th- I think about today in Chwane where you've got a solution on the table, you're trying to help people keep the lights on, help businesses keep the lights on. Because remember, load shedding is job shedding. Mm, when mm, those mm. lights go off, and yes, it's inconvenient for us and our MacBook mm, shut down mm, and all mm. that sort of thing, but there's factories that shut down yep. and those factories mean jobs. You must go to a mall, it's a ghost town. Yeah, yeah. And, and those are jobs. And it's, and it's young people again that mm. are, the, are, are, are the, the people who've got to bear the brunt of that, that are being let go by these companies. So you've got to, you've got to bring in independent power producers and we've got to move away from a monopoly. We've got to have competition in the energy industry so that if someone's treating us badly as a customer, we can go to somebody else. And if we don't like them, there's somebody else that we can go to. Also, you saw when you got more players in the scene, cell phone prices went down. Yes, yes. Data prices go down because they're competing against each other. Yeah. The same can be there for electricity. And here's the thing. This is my final point on this. So, is that we could employ young people in huge amounts 
if we opened up a greenfield industry of renewable energy in South Africa. Sure. There's a whole new job market for, for young people. We've got young people who are probably hustling just to you know, pay for the data to watch us mm, you know, on right this now. podcast yeah, yeah, right yeah. now, who are sending off CVs, desperately trying to find a job, who are, you know, are just hustling to get by every single day. You know, imagine the jobs that we could be creating for young people if we, we pioneered a whole new industry in South Africa of sure. renewable energy. You were saying with Atwane, what's the issue there where you guys have, 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 a, have a mayor, Randall Williams. Yes. What's the issue with the electricity you so, guys were trying so to they provide? Were, they were solutions? trying to get a public-private um, partnership with the municipality with two or three of the power stations to help get the municipality able to produce its own electricity without having to run Eskim. Uh, and it wanted to go to a public process, but some of the coalition partners are a little bit upset about it, so we'll have to go back to the drawing board. But it just frustrates me because, you know, when you can see the solution in sight mm. and, so are you, and you're being frustrated by it, it's difficult. Are you saying that coalition parties would literally not vote for a solution simply because it's going to make the DA look good? I don't know if it's going to make the DA look good but it, or, or what, but, I mean, it's just to me... It's like watching a house on fire and then you say to the person bringing a bucket of water, no, don't bring that bucket of water. Yeah, I don't like the color of the bucket. Oh, I don't like the color of the bucket. Hey, don't go there. Yeah. I can see you're going to be about to jub jub me. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it. I can see hey, it. I, can I, see I forgot it. you got divorced. I can see where, I I can see where this is going. <laughs> hey, Jono! Hey, he's a chiller, man. <laughs> hey, Jono! <laughs> well, listen, I've moved on, but the other guy started a whole new political party just to get back at me, so... <laughs> 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 That's crazy, man. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Soweto, man. Is it true that um, the electricity has gone up or something like that since you guys took, took over? Well, what the city's doing is making sure that people who can pay for the electricity pay for it. The city's got an indigent tariff that allows poor South Africans who can't afford a certain amount of free electricity. But the city can't afford to carry thousands of consumers using electricity for free. Everyone's got to pay their share. Mm. And, and everybody should make some contribution to the cost of it. Uh, and so I think what the city's trying to do is to get everyone who can pay to pay um, through installing meters, reducing illegal connections and, and the like. If more people pay, the price of electricity can actually come down mm. because you know, there's a bigger pool. Mm, bigger pie. More people paying and you don't then need to, you know, there's more people to help subsidize the infrastructure and the maintenance. So the costs come down. Um, it's a huge problem in South Africa that we have where people don't want to pay. There's always got to be a safety net for people who can't pay. And you can never leave people without electricity or water. It's a basic human right. And, but people who can pay should make some contribution. So the prices did go up? I presume they've gone up. But also remember the prices aren't set by the city alone. Nursa... Um, which is in the uh, National Electricity Regulator in South Africa, allows Eskom to set a price and makes oh. an application, and they then pass it on to the city. So it's the same as, uh, you know, as, as, you know, as your gin. If your cost goes up on the gin, of course. you're not going to bear the cost. You're going to pass it on to Tops yeah. or to me as the customer. 100%. So that's what happens. So NURSA allows Eskom to put the price up. Eskom then charges the city more. The city's got to charge the consumer more. What's and again, if we break the, the, the monopoly and we bring in efficient clean energy and green energy, we can bring the price down. And I don't know why we're dragging our feet. What's your take on land reform? I think land reform is one of the big burning issues, and I think it's still an open sore in South Africa that's a source of great anger. And I get cross when people say it isn't an issue. It is an issue. Uh, we've had 100 years of legislative dispossession of land in South Africa, and not enough uh, black South Africans own the land that they live on or or own access to property. So there's a number of ways you address that. And if you look at the high-level panel report that Khalema Mutlante did, and he's not a DA man, he's yeah. a former ANC president, sure. said the three biggest impediments to land reform in South Africa, meaningful land reform, are the fact that there's never been more than 1% of the budget that's been set aside for land reform. So okay. you can't tell me you're serious about something if you're not willing to set aside more than 1% of your budget for it. Secondly, elite capture of the process. So the stuff we saw at Freda Dairy where... Land should have gone to land reform beneficiaries, but went to the Guptas, and they used the money, child the money for their wedding. Mm. And the third thing um, that he said is that there's huge um, corruption and maladministration in it. So how do we solve it? Well, I think you don't resolve it by expropriation without compensation. And I don't buy the argument that the state must own all the land. And you, know, you start by what we're doing, well-located, 
public land like Conradi and Pinelands in Cape Town, where we did a partnership with a private housing developer who's built a, a mixed-use development, residential and commercial, which has a range of, of accommodation options from someone who, who can't pay anything to someone who can pay a thousand rand a month to a bonded property, all in the same development. And you, you create those mixed-use developments, well-located, public-owned land. And the most important thing, give people title for that land. It's no use you know, saying, well, there's, there's the cup, but you don't own it. You can't do anything with it. You, people have got to own the land. The second thing you've got to do is where you have handed over property, give title deeds. And thirdly, we've got to look at, at and, and it's a campaign we're going to be rolling out over the next few months, on uh, tribal trust land, people who live in rural areas particularly, okay. to give them the land that they're on. They've got no title. They've got no security of tenure. They can't pass it on in title to their children. They can't develop it. They can't do anything with it. It's a dead asset. If you parcel it up, have it surveyed, and you give people title for that, to that land that they're on and living on, you can then give them an asset that they can then leverage to pay for their children's studies. They can bond the property. They can develop it. They can sell it if they want to. Um, but you, you've got to give people title. We can't keep people in a feudal system in South Africa. And that was my big fight with the EFF over this. They want the state to own all the land and for all of us to live <coughs> like serfs on the land. I mm. don't want to be a serf. Mm. I, I want to own the property that, I, that I'm on and I want to be able to, to have it as my asset. And I think if we can create an entire property-owning class of South Africans and more South Africans own property, I think it's going to be so much better for the economy as well because people will have some form of asset that they can then leverage for finance and we've got to focus on that. But trying to scapegoat the constitution and trying to get expropriation without compensation was never go it was always the red herring. It was a distraction from the real problems. Stop the corruption, put your money where your mouth is, if you're serious about land reform, and government owns millions of hectares of well-located private, uh, well-located public land, close to cities. Because that's the other big myth, is that everyone wants to go and farm. Sure. The big pressure for land is in urban and peri-urban areas because mm. people want access to schools, mm. clinics, shopping malls, housing, <laughs> movies, mm. and those sort of things. They want to they want to be there in healthcare facilities. They want to be close to cities. That's where the real pressure is. And government owns millions of hectares of it. Why are we sitting on it? Government doesn't need it. Pass it up. Give it to people, and start there. If we then need to expropriate other property, we can look at doing it down the line. But should you go for the low-hanging fruit first, mm. the easy stuff first? Mm. Government owns the land. Government must give the land to the people. Give them the land to own. Simple as that. And if we can start with that, I can tell you we would really alleviate 90% of the problem. Hmm. I'm not sure about that. What do you think, Saul, about that? Hey, I don't know, man. It sounds like some well-spoken political talk. Mm -hmm. You know, but next in action, action, in action, action say, things are very gonna, different. Next thing you're going to say, it's a gin speaking. <laughs> <laughs> the gin is a truth but we, serum. But we, but we, the gin <laughs> is the truth serum. But we've done it. But that's the thing. We've done it. We've done it in Cape Town. We've, we've created um, properties where people now own the property that they live on. We do site and service where we provide the services and the people can, can build a home. We, here's people, my thing. Here's people my thing. say that's just when, one city. Here's my thing. When the land was taken from us, they, they didn't have to go through all of this that you're saying. But now that we want it back, you got to do this, you got to do that. Hey, just give it back. <laughs> you know it's what not, I'm saying, dog? It's not yeah. that easy. It's not especially that easy. Because, it's not that easy. Especially because though. those who hold the title of these mm. have been bought it for cents. Yeah. For yeah. Well, they bought it for mirrors and beads. <laughs> you guys gave it away too cheaply. Yeah. Yeah, you know yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, here's, but here's the thing. Then it should here's, be brought back cheaply. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if you're going to use that logic. Okay, but, but then, then why are we not using the Constitution to, to do that then? Why is government saying the Constitution is the problem? Gov the Constitution is not the problem. If you look at what the Constitution it says, it says government must, not may, not perhaps if the weather's good, sure. not, it says it must set aside uh, you know, and, and prioritize land redistribution. And it's got to do that. Uh, and why is it not doing that? Why is it? You don't need, let, to, you don't need to, you don't need expropriation or compensation. To it. If you have a look at the, at the categories of, 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 of how you can expropriate land, the expropriation clause as it currently sits now is more than sufficient to do anything that you need. This government lacks the will to do what needs to be done. So let's go to Joburg. You guys run yeah. Joburg. Do you own some of the land and can you do stuff with yes. it? Yes. So what, what do you guys do? We also own some of the land. So in, in, in Chwane, for instance, yeah, yeah. we've just built 
a huge mixed-use development right in the city centre. Oh, wow. It's going to provide 2,000 units for, for families. Oh, wow. To be able wow, to man. cross-subsidised. So, oh, you guys yeah, own that yeah, land. So, that's what so what do. you do is you, you get, a, in a public-private partnership, you, you bring in developers, and they develop, and you sell off the, the units to, to people. Mm. You provide the land. That's government's role. Developers develop the property, and then you sell that on or you grant are these white to, developers or black developers well, doesn't matter the one in Cape Town is uh, uh, Conradi is a, is a black owned developer okay uh, who's, shout who's out to developer. him can you give him yeah. a shout out shout, hey, out, shout out Conradi <laughs> representing yeah. he's the token black that one no no it's a black owned company it's a oh. uh, 100% black owned company nice in Joburg what's happening in Tembisa man because I mean we know Joburg and Popalati she's the mayor Tembisa there's protests mm. uh, the indigency has been taken away the electricity, they're not buying directly from ESCOM. They're buying through municipality. We've got a guy from Tembisa here, our driver, Tuso. Oh, yeah, well, yeah What's yeah. going on there? Yeah. Like, how, so, and, so, is it bad there? First of all, Tembisa is part of Ekoleni. Tembisa is part of Ekoleni. Oh, is it Ekoleni? Yeah, yeah, so, that's, yeah, yeah. so why was the DA... Uh, the, no, it's Tanya Campbell. Saying that they, the no. DA was saying they're trying to make DA ungovernable. Mm. Yeah, no, the DA runs, uh, runs it as part of a, of a minority government in, in Ekoleni. And it's tough. It's not easy. Um, the mayor's been on the ground there trying to resolve some of those issues. There are long-standing issues there that, that frankly, have, people are made promises every year are going to be resolved, mm. and they don't get resolved. Mm. Um, and I think people are frustrated. And, you know, we've made sure the mayor has been on the ground and addressing those communities, trying to deal with some of the problems that they're facing, and to try and resolve some of those problems. But Ekoleni is a real problem municipality. Mm. It's It's really... It's one of those municipalities that's been so badly neglected sure. that it's very, very difficult to, to turn things around quickly. And people are frustrated. And, and that's one of the frustrations we face as politicians. You know, people think that when you get elected, you suddenly get a Harry Potter wand and you can, mm. you can fix things. Yeah, around. but with it the does multi... Take a, it does take a while. And with the multi-party coalition... Ma yeah, it's a coalition. You've got to bring... You know, it's actually a minority government there. It's a coalition and it doesn't have its own majority. We've got to rely on bringing other parties on oh. the council to belong. So it's tough. But you know what? You've got to try, and you've got to do your best to, Isn't to deliver. Isn't it weird how all these politicians live at DA-run uh, municipalities? Well, I always say that about the president. He didn't choose to build his mansion in Durban <laughs> or Buffalo City. Or Limpopo, where he comes yeah, from. Yeah, or Limpopo. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think he uses a Limpopo house to, as a bank to store, <laughs> to store, those, to store the, the Upala Pala dollar bill. <laughs> <laughs> so he's um, he's uh, so he uses the uses the Limpopo house to store the money, but he's got a big mansion in Camps Bay uh, above the above the ocean. There. That he doesn't mention. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. And there's no load shedding there either. You'll be happy to know. <laughs> The lights are always on. <laughs> Speaking about para para, man, what did you think about that? Because I heard you guys contacted the F FBI, no? The FBI. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I heard about it. Yeah, that. well, look, I mean, I'm very worried about it. I mean, I, it's that not... is wild, bro. That is wild. That story is wild. They're independent. They're foreign. So, yeah, it makes sense to me, but it's wild, though. Yeah, it is very... It's, it's really... I mean, it's odd to have that amount of dollars at your house, but to put it in your couch, <laughs> in your, under your mattress... Well, there's somebody said to me the other day that maybe needed to put it under the mattress because if you don't have a spine, you need something to keep ah! straight it. Straight it. To Lala Gashley. So, but, um, yeah, and I, and I think that he's handled it badly. I mean, we still don't know what the answer is. I mean, he's about as, makes about as much sense as Advocate Tefo on this thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. He's, uh, he's, what did the FBI say? We haven't got an answer back from them yet. I think they're very busy. How do you but contact the FBI, bro? We just wrote, they've got an office in Pretoria. Oh, is it? You know, the American. The, the Americans are everywhere. The, uh, the Americans yeah, are everywhere. The embassy. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. They, they're here in Pretoria. They've got an office in Pretoria. Wow. They've probably even got cameras in your, in your lights. Nah, nah, nah. No, the FBI, they see everything. Nah, we good. We've got our people. We're good. And, and what's your take on Operation Dudula? So, look, I just think that, I think that what's happening here you know, there's this game in Kuala Lumpur called Mlaba Laba. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I think government... Mlaba Laba. Mlaba Laba. Yeah, you call it Mlaba Laba. They're playing Mlaba Laba. It's just Raba with an M. Raba Raba with us. In KZN, we call it Mlaba. Mlaba Laba. So, yeah, we do things differently in KZN. 
I think government's playing blah, blah, blah with us. So we, we, uh, you can't scapegoat people for your own failures. And I think, yes, let's start with the point. We've got to have stronger borders. Yes. That washing line that Auntie Pat <laughs> put up there, I mean, that's <laughs> not going to cut it. You know, you, you've got to have strong borders. Yeah. And we've got to prevent illegal immigration from happening. But you can't blame other people for government's failures. And okay. I think that that's what's happening far too much. Mm. Um, Yes, there's unemployment. Um, it's the highest unemployment in the world. But that's not because of the foreigners. It's because this government's policies are so terrible that they are pushing us into the unemployment queues and pushing young people into the employment queue every single day. Mm. Focus on addressing those things. And you, you won't... I, I think scapegoating people and the violence that you're seeing happening, I, I think, is, is not acceptable. Violence can never be the solution to a problem. Um, and then also... I've got to get our home affairs working properly. I mean, I, when we went to, to the home affairs office down downtown Joburg um, a month ago, there was a lady that was, she, she had to take three days off work just to get a birth certificate for her child. Jeez. You wait and queue there for the whole day just to get to apply for an ID. Mm. It's not right. And if they can't help citizens, how are they helping to process immigrants as well? So Oof. we need to Ooh, re, yes. we need to reform our home affairs system mm. And turn it into one that we know everyone who's in the country, who they are, why are they here, etc. And yeah. and but but beating up foreigners, I think, is abhorrent. And I think that as leaders, we need to show leadership to communities that violence is not the answer. And I'll tell you why, because in South Africa, and you spoke about it earlier, we still there are still deep deep differences. Yeah. There's tribal. Yeah. There's language. Of course. Of course. Um, there's racial. Racial. Yeah. yeah. And if you start a camp fire, a fire in, in one of the camps, camp foreigners, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> camp, it can jump very quickly into the others. Mm. And we need to be very careful of that in South Africa. Violence is not the answer to, to any problem. Um, but I don't think they're committing violence, Operation Dudula. Well, there's been some violent uh, repercussions of it. We've seen people being beaten up and stabbed and their shops destroyed. Isn't that a smear campaign to make it look like the operation is... I, I, I think that when you create the environment that makes that sort of thing acceptable by targeting foreigners, you must then take responsibility. You can't light the fuse okay. and then say, well, I didn't, I didn't, oh, okay, I didn't I explode the, the dynamite. Yeah. Take the responsibility <laughs> when the dynamite blows up. Yeah. yeah. I got some questions from my chillers, yeah? Uh, Hello, someone chillers. Someone saying, yeah, what's the DA stance on dictatorship in Swaziland, especially considering that John travelled to the Ukraine to condemn Russia but oh, is yeah. here to strongly condemn the atrocities happening just next door. Well, I have. Uh, <clears throat> I actually have. And I spent the last week in Kenya uh, observing their election. Yeah. And I was in Somaliland before that. So this notion that, you know, you only go to the Ukraine is, is absolute nonsense. I think it's wrong. And, I mean, for Africa to survive and prosper, democracy has to prosper. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Economic Freedom of the World Index, the countries that have the highest per capita income are all the most free countries. We've got to support democracy and we've got to strike out against dictators in Africa and people who overstay their welcome um, must be kicked out of office. What's happening in Swaziland is appalling. It is a, it is a dictatorship of the worst kind and those who are pro-democracy are being targeted in the most terrible way. And this is the thing that frustrates me about South Africa is that we've got a lot to say about the Middle East but we've got nothing to say as a government about Swaziland 100%. where we have a real... We've got real influence. Yeah. We've got trading ties. Oh. We're in a customs union with them. We've got all, these, all this it's influence over It's South Africa, to be honest. Let's be honest. Yeah, exactly. Much. Well, it's our 10th pretty... province. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, maybe we should swap Limpopo for them. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Hey, don't touch Limpopo. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, so, 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 yeah. <laughs> There's something we could really be, be, why is the president not sending an envoy in there and saying, stop this nonsense, mm. bring democracy, let's have free and fair elections and let the people decide who must lead them. And, you know, I, it frustrates me to see that. I, I love democracy, which is why I love going to watch elections and, I like being in places where, you know, democracy is fighting back. And it's, it's wrong what's happening in Swaziland. Which, uh, which country in Africa do you think is well run? Botswana. Botswana, I think yeah. Botswana is, is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we were there last week. Were you? When we were in Botswana. Yeah. When you were in Botswana. Left my, 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 my,
I would just, like, separate trip. We we'll travel all, all over the world here, you know. Now, well, next time I'll take you guys to Ukraine, then you can really got to change your underpants twice. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> the best part is, the best part is when people said on on social media. I love social media. They said, oh no, he went there on a holiday. Dude, you go on a holiday to Ibiza to the Mazzotti wedding. You don't go. You don't go. You don't go. Shots fired. You don't go. You don't go to Ukraine where they're propping missiles. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. you know some fancy hotel suite, obviously. No, it wasn't. No, I don't travel like that. Mm. I know. I know everyone oh, thinks we do. Come on, John. You don't travel econ economy class. Of course I do. Mm. Of course I do. Hey, man. Until you're a mayor. No, or I'm, the president. I'm the, leader, I'm the leader of the opposition. I arrived here outside your studio in a golf. Oh, yeah, yeah. You yeah, did. I did. In Where do you golf. stay when you're in Joburg? Where do you At stay? the Wanderers Hotel in Pretoria. Don't tell man that, don't get my number out to sell all the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, do you know the hotel? <laughs> I don't know it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, here's the next question. Why was Solly never reprimanded for his questionable behavior in his private life, or was he internally reprimanded? Solly Masangu. Mm. No, Solly Mzamanga. Yeah. Oh, Mzamanga. Oh, what was his behavior? I don't know. It's a question from each other. Uh. Do you want to Google this? Or what did Solly do? Oh, no. It was, hey, it was the... Solly? It was the, Solly who? It's a punch-up. Oh, okay. Yeah. What happened? Oh, I think he got into a private dispute with somebody. It happens from time to time. And you know, everyone thinks politicians are robots. We're not. we ordinary people. So he punched someone? Well, someone punched him, I think. Solly Simang, not Machangos. Yes. Remember yeah, yeah, that yeah. video where he was bloody. Yeah. So, he owed someone or something happened. Remember? Oh, wow. Anyway. And the, the guy shot him flames. Yeah, yeah the guy shot him flames, but a few hours later, the guy was outside not the police Macham. station with his arm around Solly and they were good mates. Yes, oh, I remember. Oh, you listen to this viral yeah. video. Yeah. Yeah. He was all bloodied up and stuff. Yeah. Hey. As I say, I think he got punched. Not <laughs> no, no, no. Solly got punched. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. He got uh, I'm sure you punch. get this a lot, man. Yeah. Uh, Helen Zilla has made some outlandish statements before as the leader of the party. What steps were taken when such happens? Look, let me just talk about Gogo because... Yo, hey, is that a name? Gogo? Yeah, these guys. Is, I've never seen so many like grown men so terrified of Gogo. <laughs> and I hope you're going to have her on the show. She'll show you guys flames. For she real? Will. No, oh, yeah. bring it on. Yeah, bring you guys on. must, bring have, you guys must have, we must have Gogo on the show one yeah. day. Sure. <laughs> but um, let me tell you about it. She's the most successful premier in post-democratic South Africa. She didn't talk about building a better uh, province and giving people jobs. She was the world mayor of the year. Jeez. You'd be crazy not having someone like that around your table. Mm. Do you want their fingers on Twitter? Maybe not. Mm. And I think that, you know, I, I think that Twitter's a dangerous place for politicians to be. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think that in Twitter you can be misrepresented and misunderstood of very course. quickly. Mm. 140 characters, very low. And, you know, I, I always say too many tweets make a twit. I tell my caucus that all the time. Yeah. yeah. So, and there's a yeah. lot of trolls there. Yeah, a lot of trolls. A lot of trolls. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, he removed Pumzila Van Dam as Shadow Minister of Communications and replaced her with Zakele Mbele. Did that happen? Yeah, it did happen. Yeah? yeah why, why, did happen. why did you do that? Well, I think we needed a change in the, in the portfolio. And just like the president changes his cabinet, I changed my, my shadow cabinet from time to time. It's, it's what politicians do. Is there bad blood between you guys? Well, not from my side, but I, you know, I gather from social media. She doesn't really like me very much, but is it? you know, I'd say live and it live. We all, you know, all... but I like Pumzile, man. I, I thought she had a good yeah. thing going on there. Oh, so did I. Yeah. <laughs> how do you how do you fire her? Like w on what basis? Well, it wasn't a matter of firing anybody. It was mm. a matter of just making some changes in the portfolios in in Parliament, and you know, it happens from time to time. We we generally do it once or twice a year. And, and what, what, uh, what do you take in consideration? Like the performance or what? Well, it's a variety of factors yeah. around, you know, performance, but also what you want to achieve in that portfolio. Okay. And, and what you want to do. So Zach's moved on. I mean, I've replaced him with Solly, um, Solly um, uh, Malazzi is now yeah. the, on, on communications and I think he's doing a great job. But you've got to, you've got to keep it fresh. You know, so it's like radio. When we get fired on radios, yeah. we're taking a different direction. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Unless you're Eusebius, where you don't get another job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, 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 drop Look. that thing, my man. <laughs> you're clearly an Orlando Paris fan <laughs> fucking up Kaiser. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, an, I'm, a Zulu. <laughs> I'm an I'm a Zulu supporter, so I'm used to being on the losing side. <laughs> My Zulu losers. <laughs> you, still, you still support Amazulu? Yes, I still do. And, and the Sharks? And the Sharks, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So I'm used, yeah, to, you, used, to, say, used to being on the losing side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Last player I know from the Sharks is James Small, yeah? Oh, James that's, Small. Yeah. Yeah, he was when I, I was when you're small. small. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the resignation of Musi Maimani, him and Mashaba, John Moody, Bongani Baloi, uh, Pumzile, Mbalin Tuli. What part did you play? Well, you know, there's this notion in the party that as a leader you can purge people and do all sorts of things. It's not true. Mm. Uh, we're a party of, of due process. The leader's actually got very limited powers to But you've got to be honest, them. it looked bad because they're all black. Yeah, of course, it doesn't, yeah, doesn't look great. But here's the thing. Yeah. People come and go all the time in parties. For I mean, sure. last week, Herman Mashaba had six people resign in KZN. Oh, for real? Yeah. Nobody said anything about that. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, the EFF today you know, got rid of somebody, this Kanile guy. Mm. Um, people come and go in politics. Sure. And I think it's good for politics as well. You know, it's like a shark with his teeth, you know. Shocks. Shark's got to, you know, lose teeth for new ones to come forward. And I think when people move on, the party's values and principles remain the same. Our mission remains the same. We want to be the core of a new majority. We want to make the ANC a minority party. And we want to deliver services for people. Um, and that mission doesn't change. And yes, people come and go. And I'm not happy when people go. Yeah. You know, it's not something I stand on a table and open a bottle of champagne over. But you accept that some people's journey is run a certain way. They, you know, they, they want to do something different. That's their thing. But our job is to keep the party moving forward. And what factors uh, were in play when you got rid of Musi Maimani? Like well, we never got rid of Musi. That's okay. the thing. Musi resigned on his own accord. Mm. There was a report that was done that he commissioned, yeah. and he chose the people to do the report. They were handpicked by him, and that report made some recommendations. He chose to resign as a result of those recommendations. He wasn't fired. In fact, quite the opposite. The federal executive asked him to stay on. Mm. He made the choice, and it's his choice. And that's the thing about politics. It's about having the freedom to to choose and make the decisions that you want and you feel are best for you. And he made that decision. I think it was the wrong decision, mm. but it was his decision to make. And, you know, he's Who doing his own him? thing. Do you, do you fire him? No, nobody, nobody gets resigned. fired. Oh, sorry, he man, resigned, yeah. yeah. Uh, was he really in charge, though? Like, of when course he, he was. If he said, I want X to happen, did he have to go through a Stian Hazen or somebody else? No, I actually, I actually worked for him, if you may recall. I was, uh, yeah, I was yeah, yeah, the chief yeah. whip. So yeah, I, but I worked for him, and and the leader of the party is the leader of the party, and he very much set the direction and the determination about where the party was going. He chose to set the party on a course, and it was his decision to make. And you know, you get behind and support that. So the buck and stopped with him. Yeah, the buck stopped with him absolutely. Because we had him right on this very chair that you're mm. sitting on. I watched. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, of course, <laughs> of course. Of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> and what we got, I could be wrong, right? Uh, but the feeling I got, so you, you correct me if I'm wrong, no? I will. The feeling I got is that he left because he wanted some drastic changes made in the DA and he was being... That the party wasn't willing to make. Yes. Or, or support him on. Yes. Well, I fundamentally disagree with, mm. with, that, um, with that analysis. Mm. Or, he must tell us what these changes that he wanted to make were and why were they not tabled at the federal executive? Why were they not brought to the federal council? That's how you get things changed mm. in the party, um, through policies and through and through tabling stuff to get it done. Because yeah. I said, have to do it in the party. I mean, uh, that's how, if I want to get anything done, you know, you've got to work through your structures of your party. Because he said he was having difficulty making the DA appeal to majority of the black people because of those kind of things where you're trying to make decisions that and, and policies that appeal to a lot of black people, but the whites in the DA are like, nah, it's not going to happen here, bro. I think, I think that's a simplistic argument, and I don't think it's, it's a true reflection of what happened, and mm. I think it's reflected in the 2019 result mm. that we lost votes across the board. Mm, mm, and... Mm. You know, that's not good for a political party. Mm. What do you say to black people that just don't trust you because you're white? Because let's be He's honest. Answered them, right? answered them the no, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what the answer is. The answer is, you know, when you're coming out, you don't get a button to press on the side saying, can I come out as black, white, female, male? You know, I'm, I am who I am. Uh, this is how I was born. And I can choose to make a contribution or I can choose not to. And I've mm. chosen to, to get up and make that contribution. And, and, and I say again, you know, Helen Sussman didn't have to be a black political prisoner on Robben Island to stand up for black political prisoners and their rights on Robben Island. Fair enough. Um, I don't need to be a poor black young South African 
to stand up every day and fight for a better future for poor young black South Africans, to fight for a place in the sun for them in South Africa, for employment, for better education, for greater advancement in higher education. And you can fight passionately for things, you know, even if you're not part of that particular group. And that's what I like to think, you know, I, I would like to do. I, I want to I want to serve. I want to make a difference. And it shouldn't matter what the colour of my skin is. Judge me on what I deliver. Can I deliver you a better tertiary education? Can I deliver you a better municipality? Can I deliver you better services? Can I deliver your children a better uh, teacher in their classroom? And I think the answer to that is yes. And I want to do that for more South Africans. And that's what drives me. And yes, I may be white, but you know, I can't change that. But I can change South Africa. And that's what my goal is. Got you, man. On a lighter note, let's talk about your personal life, father, <laughs> wife, father, kids. <laughs> Second wife. Second, Second wife. wife. Second See, wife. Job, I knew the job job moment. Was <laughs> not just any wife. <laughs> Not just any wife. My, my second, my, my second and favorite wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You have the pleasure of having two, a second wife. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, not as many as Mshlozi though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah he's yeah, retired. Yeah, That's yeah, the yeah, old African yeah, yeah. thing. Let's leave the old men to rest, <laughs> man. You know. Uh, how's how's your personal life? How's how are things? Yeah, good. I'm you know I'm very happy. I've got a wonderful family, mm. who are a great source of strength and encouragement. Mm. And probably my biggest regret in my career is that I don't get to spend enough time with them. Oh, yes. Get to hang out with cool guys like you. That's yeah, probably yeah. But, you know, there's a lot of time on the road and a lot of things you miss. And, and it's – families, I think, pay the bigger price for, for you being in politics than, than anybody else. Mm. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's not cool. But they understand I'm doing what I do and what I love. And hopefully when I'm done doing what I've done, I can look back and say it was worth it. Yeah. And your first marriage, I heard, uh, um, it was because of infidelity. That yes, that of course. Did. I met somebody, I fell in love with her, and she's now my wife. Wow. And, oh! Um, yeah. wow. I thought yeah. I was a black chick, you know. <laughs> Once you go black, you never go back. <laughs> Uh, Bro, Kelly, I thought only blacks cheat White Kelly, people Kelly, cheat as well Kelly Kamala won't take my calls Hey <laughs> <laughs> Oh hey Chano Hey Chano <laughs> You're lucky she won't take your calls <laughs> Trust me You don't want her to take your calls Hey Pedro Can you believe white people cheat as well dog? Oh no they cheat Remember that Springbok guy uh, He passed away now He had a You know him What's his name There was a video Oh, U.S. U.S. Fund of West Asian. Yeah. 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 yeah, they cheat as well, bro. Yeah. It's an African yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. but see, no, it's an African Non-racialism is alive and well and living in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, music, what are you listening to? I listen to a wide variety of stuff. Um, sort of, um, I like sometimes in the evenings, listen to Leonard Cohen. I know it's mm. a bit depressing sometimes, but I like Leonard Cohen. Mm. And then I like some sort of upbeat stuff as well. Um, I really like 80s music and, mm. and the like... Um, on the local scene, um, yeah, I, just, I really liked... Uh, Favorite track right now? And if I said Weekend Special, you'd probably laugh. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. We're still stuck in the weekend from 1991. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's okay. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, there's so much. I mean, I just put the radio on and, and listen mostly. Um, yeah, I'd sort of... I, c I couldn't even think of a, of so a favorite. So you're not too fussy with the music. No, you're I'm just not like fussy Brenda. At all. Yeah. <laughs> no, I like I like just putting on on and just like having music in the background. Yeah. I find you think a lot better when there's music on in the background and yeah. when you're writing something you or you're trying to read. Uh, you, there's, I, I always like having music in the background. I've got you know music uh, you know machines in, in most of the house, so I really enjoy enjoy listening to a variety of things and. Often I'll just put on an Apple playlist and, and let nice. it play. Yeah. All right, cool. We're going to play a, a game, right? Yeah. We're going to see how black you are, right? Blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. Not blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Hey, hey. <laughs> so we, we call this the black test because every okay. single black person knows this. Okay. So we're going to see how black you are, right? Oh, yeah, are you yeah. ready? Are you ready? Uh, who played Achi Muroka? I don't know. Oh, oh, come on, oh. John! He only wants seventy lines. <laughs> Black number. He only wants seventy lines. I don't watch TV. <laughs> I don't get to watch TV. But you know, uh, Kravachen. What's his name? The, the reporter. Leon Kravachen. Yeah, exactly. So you okay. can watch yeah. TV. I'll give you a second ah. chance. Yeah. Okay. Uh, listen, am I going to get a chance to see how white you are? Yeah, yeah, we can uh, do that. Okay. Oh yeah, cool. do yeah, that yeah, to yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, please, let's yeah, do that. Called please. Co co coconut shy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, do that to us, please. Gosh. Uh, okay, I'll give you a second chance. Okay. Then. What soap you plays every single weekday on SABC One at eight PM? Uzalo. 
Oh, oh bloody, bloody hell. Johnny boy. Oh, Johnny. Come on, Johnny. Movanga. <laughs> oh, how long was she thinking? Oh, come on, Johnny. No, it's generations. Oh, generations. Oh, oh, but that's, that's, generations. Not, no, that's, that's not a proper soapy, that. Hey. Oh, come on. Dude. Come on. All right. Johnny. Here's a second question. Yeah. What does it mean if I say to you, go get a checkers? Go yeah. get a checkers? Like, get yeah. me a checkers get from the cupboard. Get me a checkers from the cupboard. She's... I don't know. <laughs> oh, Jano! Jano! <laughs> it's a plastic bag. A check is okay. as a, as oh, a, a plastic shopping bag. bag. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a grocery bag. But listen, this is from the guys who are sitting here drinking gin and tonic. <laughs> Huh? Ah, <laughs> Bro, even uh, your black mayors know this. Uh, your black <laughs> assistant, yeah. someone in your office, they know yeah, what a yeah, checkers is, is. You know what a checkers is. You right? know what a checkers yeah. is. A checkers is a, plastic, a grocery plastic bag. Well, listen, I did take one of those into Parliament. I don't know if you saw. <laughs> and I showed the president. Yeah. Because I was telling him how much the cost of, cost of living has gone up. Oh, I, yes. So I took a checkers in with some pilchards, yeah. oil. Some uh, some flour as well to show and show. So next time I'm going to say to man, bring you checkers. Yeah, that is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, who's the king of Amapiano? My friend is all in Boniswa. That's <laughs> all. Oh flip! Oh no! I want to say it. I won't say it. But it's cool. <laughs> hey, Azola, that's Sola. He is Patrick the king of Amapiano. That's all that guy listens to all day long. <laughs> so you don't know one artist? Um, no. Oh man, you gotta get yourself into I'm it, man. It's the biggest bro. genre in the world. Okay. It's taking over. Uh, the guy's name is Gabza the Small. He's Gabza really, the Small. Yeah, he's really yeah, massive. Bro, he's, huge. he's our king, so right? So you guys now. are like doing a good job here of showing me up, eh? <laughs> no, I think you'll get the next one. One you song are. by Brenda Fossey. There we go. Weekend special. No, no, no. This is no, a no, <laughs> weekend special. This is where after. This is many weekends after weekend special drop. The one we're asking uh, about. Uh, what does Dango mean? Dango. Mm, Dango. Thank you. Yeah! Ah, yeah. oh, Jono, he, he knows a bit of my cards. Jono, we see how you got that one right. And then this one is for the sake of the podcast, yeah? yeah. What is roadkill? What's roadkill? <laughs> Sounds a lot like my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> if, 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 if we had kids in Durban, if we had kids in Durban, Probably your ex-wife would be roadkill. <laughs> if we had gigs in Durban, your ex-wife definitely would be roadkill. If, <laughs> flat, flat chicken. <laughs> flat chicken. <laughs> oh, oh my God! <laughs> That's it. That was the last question. Oh, that's a beautiful answer. Oh, your ex wife. All right, let's do the coconut test. All right, cool. No, no, no. We're going to do the coconut test. Oh, okay, coconut cool. Test. I'm going to. Come I'm, on. A coconut test. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was funny. Uh, <laughs> you see, we can take it. We can give it and we can take it. So give us the coconut test. The coconut test. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of something that uh, yeah, that's um, like pearly white. Who yeah. who is uh, who is the uh, who is the head of Afri Forum? Oh fuck! You oh, know this guy, bro. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they have him on that Urania fucking <laughs> documentary? <laughs> fuck. <laughs> okay, okay. Who was Stop the fake? Uh, no. <laughs> who was the first? Who was the first leader of the Democratic Party? Oh, I know this. His father was a lawyer in apartheid. His no. father actually hanged Tony Leon. No, Zach De Beer. Oh, no. No. I know Tony Leon. Yeah, you know yeah Tony the, Leon. He, his father hanged uh, um, Solomon Machado. No, that's Tony not Leon. true. That's fake news. Is that fake news? Fake news. Who hanged? Uh, Solomon Macron. It was Andrew Zondo you're talking about. Yo. Andrew Zondo? Yes. A black man? Yeah. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Andrew Zondo. Oh, ah, yeah, Andrew Zondo. Ah, yeah. Anyway, in closing. Uh, oh, no, is it over already? No, 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 let him ask. Let I him ask. We just start. No, 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 I'm saying are we closing already? I thought you were going to ask. Yeah, me. yeah. Wait, wait, man. Andrew Zondo was an controversies where. Yeah. Oh, oh, Tony Leon's father hanged Andrew Zondo. He didn't hang him. He was a judge at the time and he was bound by sentencing to do it. But anyway, it's, Jesus. Oh, I'm very enough. glad that we don't have the death penalty. So Tony Leon's father hanged uh, Kilsar. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's hectic. Any more questions on how coconut are you? Um, no, I think we're done. Okay. We're uh, done, yeah? No, no, I think we're done. On that. Oh, yeah. we're done. Ah, yeah. okay. I wanted to ask you, so you wake up tomorrow, you're the president. What are we changing? Yeah, man. First thing we're going to do is one. fix electricity so that we can get the economy back up and running and working. Please, please. 
The second thing we're going to send to jail, these guys who have been stealing money from our people. Everyone says corruption is a victimless crime. It's not. Uh, the victims of corruption mm -hmm. are the 30 million South Africans who live in poverty, and uh, that money is stealing their future. And the third thing, fix the education system so that we can give our young people a fighting chance to get the skills they need to compete in uh, the, the growing economy. And uh, fourthly, to make sure that we create, focus on bringing lots of jobs into South Africa through investment. We've got to get our people back to work. Mm. You cannot have a situation where young graduates, and I'm saying that as South Africa's most famous matriculant. Yes, uh, yes, 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 by uh, the we, way. Where we've got young hey. graduates, young graduates <laughs> who, who don't, you know, who can't get work. Mm. Everybody who wants to work in South Africa should be able to work. And it makes me angry to see young people sitting at home wasting away when they've got a huge contribution to make. So we've got to get job creation going and we've got to start spending money on uplifting uh, particularly young South Africans, giving them a fighting chance for the future. Those are the, those are the key priorities. And if we focus on getting those things right, uh, everything else will follow from that. Yeah. Can you talk to the white people in the private sector give us some money? We're the biggest sure. podcast in Africa with no cool. sponsorship. I'll speak to I'll yeah, speak we'll to the Stellenbosch mafia for you. <laughs> hey, you know. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, this oh, way. Yeah, I'll ask I'll ask I'll ask Cyril to speak to him for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny guy. <laughs> Do you take dollars? <laughs> <laughs> How come you guys haven't sponsored on our show? Eh? How come you well, didn't know we could? Of course. Well, I've done two business. product endorsements already. Hey, I've been getting a free model. I like that. I like Land that. your gin. Every home should have one. Hey, I like that. I like that. I like that. No, but we're open for business, man. Oh, good. I like it. Every hustle matters. And yeah. I was in Kenya, and that, that was the one candidate slogan. Every hustle matters. Mm. And it's true. We've got to make every hustle matter here in South Africa. Mm. It's the only way we're going to get, get the country How, how many terms do you want, like... Is one term enough for South Africans to give y'all guys a chance? Well, I think if you vote for us and give us a chance and you don't see change, then vote for somebody else. After That's one term. After so one, one term. term is, a, is I enough. think that you, if, we, if we were able to, in Nelson Mandela Bay, start to change things within six months, I think that the right policy decisions ma uh, made will make a huge difference in South Africa. You know, I think that this is the thing that frustrates me the most is that we've got such potential here. We've got the most amazing country. We've got young people that want to work. Yeah. We've got dynamic people. We've got people who invent new things all the time. This country has is, is go, got to go places. And I think we've only scratched the surface yeah, of our potential. Yeah. Okay. Get the right government in place and you're going to unleash a whole revolution of, of jobs and growth and prosperity. And then I really think our country is going to be a, a great place. How beautiful is, is this, eh? It's great. Every time I travel overseas, I want to come home to South Africa. Same here, yeah. bro. I'm always glad when you touch down and, you know, you get that greeting at Joburg Airport. Mm. Look, sometimes it's a bit grumpy. The escalators don't work at the yeah, airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got but, to walk up. But the Wi-Fi doesn't work. Yeah. The, there's no Wi-Fi at yeah. the airport. But you're happy to be home. Yes, you know? yes. There's something about South Africa that is, is worth fighting for. Yeah. And I think that's why I do what I do and... I think it's why you guys do what you do. Of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Penduka, in closing, any question you want to ask him? Nah, I've asked him all the things I wanted to ask. Yeah. Mm, nah, I don't nah. think you have. How did you find out your wife was cheating, bro? Well, it wasn't her, it was me. Oh, shit! <laughs> How did she find out you were cheating? Oh, I told her. I mean, I sort of, I told you. I met Whoa. somebody. You uh, never do that as a man, bro. I met somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you never do that as a man. <laughs> hey, white oaks are built different. <laughs> Hey, honey, your steak is amazing. <laughs> you know I cheated last night. <laughs> what the fuck? Bro, you don't do that. Come on. Uh, you know what I mean? I, I'd rather be honest and straightforward wow. and, and, and upfront. And I said, look, I've met somebody and... No uh, way, John. I'm, what the... I'm in love with them. The and, and yeah, the rest follows. Like 42% of South Africans, I'm divorced. And After how long into the new relationship you, you confessed? Well, pretty soon into it. Wow. Into it. Yeah. One lay in a white man. Let's <laughs> say, baby, I cheated. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, you wow. gotta deny, 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 and continue to deny. Then deny, deny. Come on, Jono. <laughs> uh, well, maybe it should give you some uh, some some uh, satisfaction that I can't tell us. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's good. Johnny Boy, thank you so wow. much. Man. Really appreciate thank it. You guys, it's been great. Oh boy. In closing, what do you want to be remembered as? Yeah. yeah. Somebody who stood up every day and made a difference mm -hmm. and made South Africa a better place. Yeah. If people can remember me for that one thing, I'll be happy. Yeah. yeah. All the best, man. So is it thank elections you. next year? No, 24. 
2024. Yes. Yeah. All and everyone better time. be ready. Moonshot <laughs> election. For the first time. What does that mean? Yeah, uh, moonshot election. Moonshot election. For the first time in 70 years, we have the potential to break one party domination in South Africa. How, by doing what? By bringing the ANC below 50%. <laughs> But in all honesty, that's all been NC's work. No, it's also like, in our work. And yeah, but it, I mean, they've are, just yeah. fucked up enough. Yeah, of course. And it's time, for them to, it's time for them to go. And they're tired as well. There's no new ideas, there's no new people. They're tired as well. It's time for us to get a new energetic government and it's going to start moving things forward in the country. And, and that's what I'm going to spend the next 48 months working extra hard to do bring the ANC below 50%. And form something new that we can start to really get so, the country. So moving. that's something you can it be a collision? Uh, it's going to have to be a coalition. Oh, okay. Yeah, so how, how does that work now if it's a collision? Well, not a collision, a coalition. <laughs> a coalition. <laughs> but it's not a collision because <laughs> yeah. all collision you are saying yeah. about coalitions yeah. is that, who, like, if you guys appoint, let's say, a president or a mayor, mm. there's always opposition from the opposition in good decisions that mm. benefit the simple man. Mm. In the streets. Yeah. So if, let's say there's a coalition party nationally that is running or, you know, and the DA is chooses the president, it sounds like there will still be conflicting decisions but, to benefit the but average South Africa. But, but it's, a healthy, it's a healthy conflict. It's unhealthy to have one party dominating. Yes. It's better to have a group of people yeah, at the table with different opinions. Mm -hmm. And I think that out of that yep. clash of ideas comes the better option. So who's president then? Let's say it's you and well, EFF. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. But um, maybe we'll have to play a game of blah blah blah. to see the president. <laughs> we'll talk about that when, we, when it comes. Look, my goal now is to get... You guys play poker, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, oh. if you've got the big amount of chips on the table, you mm. can bully the other guys out the race. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My job now is to get as many blue chips on the table as possible. So when we play that high-stakes poker game in 24, that I can go all in and, and do what needs to be done to... In call 24... A bluff. <laughs> yeah. In 24, is it true that uh, anyone can run for president? Yeah, anyone. You can as well. For real? Yeah? Mac G for president. How's that? Jeez, grand job yeah. for everybody. You'd be surprised. Yeah? It might win. It <laughs> might win. <laughs> you, went to, you went to Ukraine. That guy was a talk show host, the president. Yeah, he was. Right? Exactly. And he won. He's yeah. a, a podcaster. podcaster. Yeah. Yeah. And he won. Yeah, exactly. You yeah. might win. Watch out, eh? Ah, president. Wait. President, deputy president. Oh, I'm a vice president. <laughs> <laughs> like Didi in my farm, smoking weed all the time. <laughs> Getting fucking high. I don't give a fuck what's going on. <laughs> oh, shit. They got Mekji's beard under his couch. And his fucking, <laughs> ooh, and his fucking mattress. <laughs> I'm good here. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's serious. How does that work? How, yeah. how does, well, you, you put explain. yourself on the ballot. And, no way. And people vote for you. And, uh, and if you know you get enough votes, you, Finally, you, you, oh. can, you can win. So why is, it, why is it only happening in 24? Because there's new legislation that's been passed to allow independents to run in the past, used a party list system. Hey, 24 is going to be crazy, hey? It's going to be lit. It's running in that lane, right? That yeah, yeah Gates and McKenzie as well. Yeah. Juju Zuma. Finally. Joe, sure, it's going to be interesting, we hey? Need, finally. Oh. Well, out of that lot, I'll definitely vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> And on that note, we are here, podcast uh, and chill. Jono! <laughs> Welcome to Black Excellence. Do not fear, for if you do, just sip on some grandeur. And if you still do, ask ourselves, what would Mapapunzi do? Parama chilla, itlesha lefiki. Bungo even when they ask you, how sabi do not fear, for if you do, just say, Anistiri. This is the medicine of censorship. This is the pill. Which one is that one? Podcast and chill.